I want to start this message with a very serious note. The joy of the Lord is my strength. 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 Ah, we could go into the laughter section, but I won't today. But I can tell you the joy of the Lord is our strength. And God is calling us back to joy in a joyous nation and world. The Holy Spirit yearns to bring God's people back to a spirit of joy. In fact, in the Old Testament, there were periods when the people were called to put aside everything else and start rejoicing in the God of their salvation. And I think it is very important for us to recognize as the different disciples were put into prison, sometimes they would sing praises to God and joy unto the God their Lord, even in the midst of perhaps dying the next day. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It is not anything else in this world. I can go to an amusement park and have a little pleasure, but I cannot have joy. Joy is something only that God gives us and only for those that have received him as their Savior. I want to begin this message or continue this message with three definitions, and you'll see it as number one on the screen. Joy means pleasure, delight, exhilaration of spirit, excitement caused by hope. And I would say the definition for hope there is assurance. So let me say it again for those watching by way of television. Joy means pleasure. If I have the joy of the Lord, I am full of pleasure. Delight, exhilaration of spirit, excitement caused by hope. I don't see a lot of that in the church of Jesus Christ today, do you? I see a lot of dismal people in many churches going through the motions, but never having the joy of the Lord as their strength. They have to be propped up all the time. Well, the joy of the Lord will prop us up better than anything else. Then note, rejoice. Rejoice means joy in the highest degree to be intensely glad. You know, when a person gets saved, they have that kind of joy, that rejoicing. They're excited. They want to tell everybody about Jesus. Sometimes they go overboard and sometimes they don't. But the reality is they've got a joy that has filled their heart. They know their sins are forgiven. They know they've been washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. And they get excited until they go to church and people cool them down. You should never be cooled down in church. You should be put on fire for Jesus Christ every time you go to church because God is revealing something very important to you in his holy word. And then the definition for happiness there. Happiness means fully contented, extensively, extensive pleasure. Fully contented, extensive pleasure pleasure. Now, all of these are indicating something about what the Christian should have in their life throughout their Christian walk. When I get to heaven, there's not going to be any reason to complain, murmur, or feel downhearted, discouraged. Everything in heaven is a finished work of God Almighty, and it's beautiful for every situation. God meant for you and I to cast our burdens on Jesus Christ and leave them there, not to carry our burdens around with us. That makes for a very sad-looking Christian. Most Christians, if they have been in a church where they're not 
urged to get the joy of the Lord back in their life, they are like a dried up apple. You ever seen a dried up apple? It looks, they even make faces out of dried up apples. And I can tell you, that's what I have looked at in the congregations I have ministered to over the years. Some of them are dried up and some are watered with the water of the word and they have a joy. The dried up ones, well, they don't have much good to say. They simply walk around like this. How are you today? About the same as yesterday. But the joy of the Lord is something that gives you an outward manifestation, not just an inward experience. It is a real joy of the Lord. And we lose it if we're not very careful with the burdens and trials of life. They're passing away, but we're not. Heaven and earth will pass away, but God's word won't. Everything about what God did for us on Calvary that we celebrated at Good Friday and then Easter, the resurrection, should be an excitement to us all year round. It should not be just, I get excited on that day and then I go back to my dismal lifestyle. Every burden I'm to cast on Jesus and if I have to cast it over and over and over and over, I cast it on Jesus and I take up the joy of the Lord as my strength. I want to be a Christian that dies with the joy of the Lord on his lips. Do you know I heard of people in nursing homes, beautiful Christians, and their last words were singing praises to Jesus. They weren't bemoaning their horrible condition. And believe me, some of them were in a horrible situation. Naomi Judd just lost her life by a physical decision. And nobody can judge her, but I can tell you this. As she was dying, her children said they were reading the 23rd Psalm to her. And she was an individual that God had magnificently healed in one case from liver cancer, miraculously, but in this case, God hadn't done it. And now she's with the Lord, rejoicing in Jesus Christ, free of mental illness, free of all that. My friends, she'll never be miserable again because of Jesus. Jesus paid for her life and her sins as he paid for ours. And she acknowledged that and she knew Jesus as her Savior. Now, I saw the daughters stand up and they couldn't have stood up and accepted the honors for their mother if God had not given them that strength. You see, the joy of the Lord helps you get through the trials of life. Everyone that has died in my family that was close to me, it was the joy of the Lord that got me through it. It was a burden. It was a loss. But there is joy in knowing to be absent from the body because they had received Christ as their Savior during their life. They were now present with the Lord. I rejoice in the death of my mother because she's with the Lord and has been there many years because of what she did when she asked Jesus to be her savior. That's when we should esteem motherhood very highly. All mothers should be honored, but a Christian mother should be honored doubly because she led us in the ways of the Lord. Joy, joy in the midst of a terrible situation. Don't let depression take the place of joy. Go against depression with the joy of the Lord as your strength. And you'll find it does what you need to do. It gives you a reason to go on, a reason to smile, a reason not to give up. It is what we need every day, a dose of the joy 
of the Lord. If I had a pill and I could give it to you, I would do that. I'd prescribe that. Jesus prescribes it to us, so I'd prescribe it to you. This is what you need. You need to start praising God and see what God does in the praise you give him for life as it is, for the joy of the Lord will enter in and give you the ability to go on and represent the kingdom of God. Jesus said, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross. See, the cross wasn't a wonderful experience, but he knew what that cross would accomplish, and it would accomplish us being with Jesus forever and ever and ever when we embraced him as our Lord and Savior. The joy, look beyond the problem to the joy of the Lord, and it will give you strength, and it gives me strength to go on. How many Christians do you know who are exhilaratedly happy, excited about life, intensely glad, I'm just using the definitions, fully contented, experiencing joy in the highest degree? How many Christians do you know? Do you know yourself? to be that kind of a Christian. That's the kind of a Christian I want to be, and I know that's what deep down, if you're not that, you want that to be in your life. You want people to see in you somebody that trusts Jesus Christ. Come every soul by sin oppressed or physical oppression, there's mercy with the Lord, and he will surely give you rest by trusting in his word. His word gives me strength. Listen to the words of our Lord in Luke 6, 22 to 23. When they shall separate you from their company and shall reproach you and cast you out of, uh, cast you out in the name, your name out, rejoice in that day and leap for joy. When persecution comes upon you, whether physical or emotional or through another instrument of any other kind, rejoice and leap for joy, for so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. We think as a Christian we're going to have an easy life if we don't grow up. When you grow up, you know that's not so. You're going to be buffeted all over the place by this world, but the joy of the Lord is what carries us through. That's why church is so important. That's why assembling is so important. That's why Jesus said, as you see the day of my coming approaching, drawing near, assemble yourselves together more than you've ever done before because alone we're going to fall apart. But together, we build each other up in the most holy faith. Together, we can make it. Together, we can have the joy of the Lord as we're encouraging each other to keep your eyes on Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You see, I have to set my affections on things above, not on things that are happening on this earth. This earth will pass away, but the things above will never pass away, and I'm heading in that direction, and so are you, and that is a happy thought. This world is not my home. I'm just passing through. My treasures are laid up in heaven somewhere beyond the blue the word of god says if jesus had not said these words to leap for joy it would seem absolutely ridiculous for someone to tell me to do that when you are rejected persecuted kicked out jumped up and down with jump up and down with excitement in other words they're doing that not because you're such a horrible person, and I hope that's so. They're doing that because you are a servant of Jesus Christ. We're in this world, but not of this world, and this world doesn't love us. If you're trying to get the world to love you, you're never going to make it. They hated Jesus without a cause. 
They'll hate you without even knowing why they're hating you. They will shun you without even knowing why they're shunning you. They will say all kinds of evil against you for my sake, says Jesus. And it's not because of you, it's because of your identification with me. Christianity isn't for wimps. It's for soldiers of Christ. And we're told in these last days to get up and fight the good fight with all of our might. It may, against, it may be against physical problems. It may be against spiritual problems or emotional problems. But we're in a battle, and we must get in that battle and fight until the day Jesus says, come up here. Now, the prophet Joel predicted a day would come when joy would wither in the house of God. It was predicted. Joel 1, verses 12 and 16. Listen. Yea, joy and gladness is cut off from the house of God. Joy is withered away from the sons of man. All they are bombarded with every day by our national news is that which would not cause you to rejoice at all. If you keep your eyes on Jesus, there's something to rejoice in every single day. It's all prophesied. It's all said in the word of God would come to pass. But look up for your redemption draweth nigh. Don't keep looking at these things and saying, what is this world coming to? I already know what this world is coming to. It's coming to hell. But God is still in control. God is still in control. God is still in control. Keep saying that to yourself when you see the awful things that are happening in this world today. These things that are causing America to deteriorate. Start saying, but God is in control. What is going on in Ukraine Say, but God is in control. I see many Christians in Ukraine saying that over and over and over. They say God is in control. And there's great choirs singing on the Internet, and they're singing the praise of God. Franklin Graham had a beautiful Easter service, and the choir that he used was in Ukraine, in the uh, city of Ukraine, and they were praising God. And you just wanted to praise God with them. We've got to look at what is true and what is great, and it's the word of God and the truth of God, and we've got to start praising God and recognizing that these things would not come to pass if God was not permitting them, but God is still in control, and he'll have the last word. Let's give him praise. He is a mighty God, a mighty God. This drying up of joy and gladness that uh, Joel was talking about in the believers of his day is evident everywhere in the world that you look today. So many of God's people look sad. They really do. And many of them look defeated all the time because they have lost the joy of the Lord as their strength. I do everything I can to maintain that. I do everything I can to maintain it, and Satan will fight it as much as anything. He wants to fight you believing God and thus having the joy of the Lord in your walk with him. Let me give you some of the reasons why joy is withering. Number two on the screen. First, we have grown weary of the way. We have grown weary of the way. What is the way? The way is the way of Christianity. We've grown weary. What is happening? Many of our churches don't preach the word of God anymore. They preach everything but the word of God. They preach that if you have this particular 
a gift of the Spirit or that particular gift of the Spirit, it's going to be making you get through the problems of life. And it won't because, you see, that gift is given because you believe the Word of God. If you don't, first of all, believe the Word of God and live the Word of God, you can't use the gift God's given you through the Holy Spirit in the proper way. So people are getting the gift, but they're not using it to reveal the Word of God is true. In every sense, it is true. Everything passes away, but his words never pass away. So they're getting weary of the churches that are in our culture today. They want a church that preaches faith, that trusts, that believes that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. They are weary of the church that just has a bunch of music but never transforms anyone's life never seeks to reach the world whether it's through the internet or whether it's through missionaries being sent or supported they are sick and tired of the organized church that does not seem real does not cause people and challenge people to follow Jesus to never let Jesus go they're sick of the church that gives them reasons to mourn, but not reasons to rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always, says the word of God. And again, Paul says, I say rejoice. You see, God is trying to call the church today and all of us to rejoice in what he has already revealed to us, knowing that there is something more that he's going to reveal in eternity. We can't even imagine the things that God has prepared for those that love him. That's what the word of God says. Start thinking of the magnificent blessings that will be yours when you leave this veil of tears. This is called a veil of tears, not because it's a happy place. It's because it's an unhappy place if your eyes aren't fixed on Jesus Christ. If you don't believe he is able to get you through the trials of life, and thus you are content with what God has got you in right now. You know, many, many times Satan has tried to make me discontented with my role as a pastor, and it's because of the numbers, and he always tries to do that. But I have learned this. Keep your eyes on Jesus Keep your eyes on Jesus. He has not won that battle, and he will never win that battle because I know the solution. Keep your eyes on Je Jesus, and the joy of the Lord will become your strength, and it has for many, many, many years. I can't tell you how many times when I was teaching, there were all kinds in the school I was teaching in, all kinds of conspiracies against me, but not by the pastor. The pastor always built me up, but by others in that particular ministry. But I kept my eyes on Jesus and never quit, never quit. I can tell you that when I went from here to Lenox and ministered in the school there, and the Bible speaks school, I can tell you very clearly there were conspiracies against me in this ministry in the early days. But I kept my eyes on Jesus, and I made it through. You see, you've got to keep your eyes on Jesus, whether you have a physical problem, an emotional problem, a spiritual problem, or a problem with conspiracies. Keep your eyes on Jesus, and you'll make it through. You'll be more than a conqueror. And that's the thing, friends. People divide churches because they don't keep their eyes on Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus and Jesus will straighten out your church if it's not what it ought to be. Keep your eyes on Jesus and Jesus will get rid of your pastor if he's not the pastor you should have there. But keep your eyes on Jesus. Satan wants you to get your eyes on other things so he can destroy your church. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you will be able to conquer all the forces of hell that come against you as a believer in Jesus Christ. 
in this particular situation that Joel's mentioning, all Israel murmured and complained except, and now this is another illustration and another part of the Bible, they had come to this point where they were all murmuring and complaining except, and you know the story, Joshua and Caleb. Joshua and Caleb, they were sent into the promised land to see, spy out the promised land. And everyone that was sent in with them, the ten that went in, only two believed that they could conquer the promised land. The others looked at the situation and said, we can't do it. We can't do it. We might as well go back to Egypt. We might as well go back to the flesh, the world. We might as well because we're no better than we were before we left Egypt under the miracle of God. You know, if you think you're no better off than you were, take a good look at where God has brought you from. Where has God brought you from? Where has he's brought you from a load of things that you can't even remember now Every day he's delivering us through things that are astoundingly wonderful in our eyes if we think about them. They forgot this, and so only two remembered that with God they can do anything. And Joshua and Caleb were those two. They never once in that whole illustration of what happened in that day wavered in their faith and joy even though all the others gave in to their mournful despair. Oh, this situation is going to kill me. Oh, this sickness is going to mean that I won't ever survive it. Oh, this, this husband or this wife, I'll never be the kind of person I ought to be because they are dragging me down. I mean, they're thinking of all these reasons why they cannot trust Jesus Christ to deal with their situation. Friends, you're at war against the spirit of Satan. He wants to make you think negative about whatever situation in your life that is overwhelming you whether it's a sickness, whether it's a family situation, whether it's a loss, you, you, you're centering your attention on things instead of Jesus. And even though those things, some of them are so wonderful and so important, but they're not as important as keeping your eyes on Jesus Christ. He is going to carry you through. Every trial and tribulation I've been through, Jesus is the one that carried me through. Every situation with a church that I had, Jesus is the one that carried me through. It wasn't me. It was Jesus every time. And it's Jesus that will carry you through whatever you're going through as well. Well, they wavered. They didn't have joy. And they lost out because they didn't keep their eyes on Jesus. Only two entered the promised land eventually, Joshua and Caleb. Number three, our joy and gladness must be the result of one great foundational truth. We are under the protective wings. We're under his protective wings. Under his wings I am safely abiding, goes the song. Under his wings I am safely abiding. If I was to let myself, I'd be singing every one of these songs, and we'd never get through the message. But that's all right, too, whatever God wants. But I can tell you this. We've got to take those songs to heart. Under God's wings we are safely protected. Nothing can come against us that God isn't going to use to benefit his kingdom and to mature his saints. Take a good look at Job if you don't believe that. It's a reality. No wonder Paul could say this in 2 Corinthians 7, verse 4, and I read it to you. I have spoken to you with great frankness. I take great pride in you. I am 
greatly encouraged in all our troubles. My joy knows no bounds. <laughs> That's a strange thing. In all of my troubles, my joy knows no bounds. He let the joy of the Lord give him the strength he needed. He knew that all things for, was for, for his sake. He knew that God would accomplish his will in his life. How can anyone under God's protective wings allow their joy and gladness to wither? If it's starting to wither, deal with it before it withers all the way. It is an affront to God to insult his faithfulness. If God be for you, what? What? It says who, but what can be against you? And God is for us. God is for you. Number four, joy is lost when fear takes root. Joy is lost when fear takes root. And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. He wants you to fear what's going to happen to you if this continues, this situation, this circumstance. He wants you to fear what's going to happen if we don't get enough income to the church. By the way, we're not worried about that because God's supplying. God's supplying. And we have had years of God giving miraculously an income to the church. You see, he used to cause fear when we were down to, what, under $10,000, way under $10,000. He used to try to cause fear, but now God has built us up to the point through gifts that we're not in fear any longer. We can just cast that off, and we can say, if God can do that, he can do anything. Like 851 friends now that we have and are building up all the time. Like people that say, will you start a ministry, and we have to refer them to the Greater Grace Ministry who can do that. We can't. Who says, please, Please keep doing the Bible studies because they bless me. And they're from foreign countries as well as those in this country. I can tell you God is reaching out and he's reaching out greatly because we wouldn't let fear stop us from doing what God has given us to do. We've been on public access so many years. How many is it now? It's about 20 years, think about that. When they started public access in this community, we were right there, the only ones from any of the churches that was on there. How did God get us to do that? Because he was training us with a black and white camera for nursing homes or from just practice for many years. Then he gave us a colored camera. We couldn't afford one in those days. And somebody gave us their colored camera, and we started doing the colored camera. Then God blessed us enough so that we could buy the camera we got now. And God just keeps on blessing. It's like that song that used to be sung, if he keeps on blessing and blessing, I don't know what I'm going to do. Probably start praising God some more. You see, God is a God who uses small things to confound the wise. And God has always done that. Notice 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love. There is no fear in love. If you know God loves you, you shouldn't be fearing for anything. But perfect love, God's kind of love, casts out fear. Because fear hath torment. And you know it does. He that fears is not made perfect or mature in love. So God is trying to rip out fear in us. And the Satan is trying to instill us with fear. Constantly trying to instill us with fear. Oh, I got a pain there. And then all of a sudden we get fearful. No, I don't have a pain there. And Or, or uh, uh, gee whiz, I, I have shortness of breath. I must have COVID. And it's not COVID at all. It's just shortness of breath. You've got sinus problems. 
but everything becomes COVID now, you know. And uh, I was listening to the news just recently, and they said, oh, you don't know what it's going to be in the fall and winter. They're trying to scare us to death. But if I have anything to say about it, we'll be having church service until God takes us home. We're not closing down. We didn't last time, and we're not going to do it this time because God is sovereign. We'll take precautions, but we won't let Satan close our outreach from this ministry because we believe in God. We do. I think people take their eyes off God, and they start taking precautions that are ridiculous. I am for precautions, but I'm not kind for the kind of precautions that say, don't assemble together, but you can go to Walmart. <laughs> Listen, stand up for faith. Stand up for faith. Number five, another reason fear takes root is because of a present unresolved tribulation or sorrow. In David, well, I like David, there are numerous Christians who cry, and this is Psalm 119, verse 143, trouble and anguish have taken hold on me. That's why some people aren't in church today. Trouble and angu anguish has taken hold on them, and it really has. You've got to pray for them. There are other people that uh, have grown used to not going to church because they've watched it on the internet and so they've grown used to not going to church and trouble and anguish has taken a hold of them cast those things down and trust Jesus trust Jesus and I'm probably preaching to the choir here but I can tell you this everybody needs to hear that because Satan knows how to give us problems everywhere there are problems there are health problems. There are concerns for business. If you're in a business, there are housing problems. You don't know whether your rent's going up. There are job problems. You don't know if you can get the job that is going to either help you or curse you. So there are education problems. All of these conspire, as I see it, to rob the people of God of their confidence in the Lord and their joy and gladness in Jesus Christ. I've seen God take somebody that lost their job and things didn't look good and give them a better job and given them a better salary because they didn't lose confidence. They trusted. It may have been a... A weak kind of trust at first, but it was a trust. And people were praying, and God was ministering to them those prayers, and they were more than conquerors in that situation because God is there for them as he's there for us. He's there for us. Now, we are warned against failing to rejoice in times of suffering. Note number six, if you will. We must not let our pain rob us of Christ's joy. We must not let our pain rob us of Christ's joy. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 to 13. Paul says this. Dear friends, they're believers. Do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals that have come upon you to test you, to test you as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice, rejoice inasmuch as you participate in the sufferings of Christ so that you may be overjoyed when his glory is revealed. Some of you that are suffering today, you're going to be overjoyed when the glory of God is revealed. What's it going to be revealed as? Your faithfulness. You don't give up. You stay in there even though all hell breaks loose in your life. You refuse to quit. There are people in this church, I'm amazed at what God has done to keep them faithful and have the joy of the Lord in the midst of a horrible situation. 
The reality is this. God says it's going to redound to his glory. Why was this man born blind? It was for the glory of God when God healed him. Everyone that is going through terrible times today physically, like Johnny Erickson Tata, who's been paralyzed from the neck down all her life since she jumped into the pool and broke her neck. If that had not happened to her, a worldwide ministry that she conducts to minister to people that are afflicted in different ways would not have been started. What is God going to do with your affliction? What does he do with my affliction? What does he do with any affliction? Probably one of the greatest afflictions I have is being old. I haven't got much time. I, I, I hope God gives me many years, but I haven't got a lot of time. I'm rising up into those years when you see a lot of the obituaries contain your age. It's an interesting thing. One of our deacons calls me every day. His name is Richie. And he says, I didn't see your name there, so I figured you were still alive. And I look at it, I, you know, I, I say to him, I didn't see yours either, huh? <laughs> you see, you have to trust God for your very life as you grow old, but you have to trust God for your affliction as you're younger. God didn't say, I'm just going to test the pastors or the pastor's wives. I'm going to test every believer. And everything God allows you to go through is going to redound to his glory if you remain steadfast and you rejoice in God. Not the situation, but in God in that situation because he is in control. And that's the reality of what God is saying there. Paul goes further and he says, as sorrowful yet rejoicing. As sorrowful yet rejoicing. The word of God goes on to say this very clearly. I may be sorrowful because of what I'm going through, but I can tell you I am still rejoicing in what God has allowed me to go through simply because it is the will of God. All things work together for good to them that love God, to those that are called at Clodden, to his purpose. And this is strong medicine to take, but we have to take it. Instead of looking down at our belly buttons, we look up at the hills and we say, This come from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord who made heaven and earth. That's what I'm looking at. Jesus, 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 the sweetest name I know. Number seven, next, joy is withering because we are ignorant of the glorious liberty of the children of God. We are ignorant of the glorious liberty of the children of God. Few Christians have the knowledge of the truth about liberty and the life-freeing sacrifice that Jesus accomplished for us to live on Calvary. They have never allowed the cross to set in the way it needs to set in and recognize that Jesus is still God and he has promised us if we'll look unto him, that which is overwhelming us in the flesh will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Number eight. We cannot rejoice and be exceedingly glad in our relationships with the Lord when we have a poor or limited knowledge of what happened at the cross. Galatians 5, 1, verse, uh, Galatians 5, 1, and then verse 13. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. He wants us to stay free, free from the devil's trying to entangle us, get us 
looking at the situation rather than the Lord. Stand firm, he says, and do not let yourselves be burdened again with the yoke of slavery to whatever is besetting you, causing you problems. Verse 13, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free from the devil having an inroad. Don't give him a place. If you give him any place in fear and doubt and, and living there is, is giving him a place, he has set you free from that by saying, look unto me, saying, look unto me. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Serve one another humbly in love. Please note number nine on the screen, if you will. Liberty defined means freedom or release from slavery. The de devil wants us to be slaves of fear, slaves of need, and I could mention a hundred other things if I had time, but I can tell you this. He wants you in bondage. God has set you free. Stay free. Stay free. Don't let him do that to you. In Isaiah, we read that the Spirit of the Lord was upon Christ, proclaiming liberty to all the captives. There were a lot of people in captivity to all kinds of things. Liberty to them that are bruised. Isaiah 61, verse 1. No longer does Satan control our wills. We have received Christ as our Savior, and we have the control of our wills back. Satan controls the wills of the unbeliever, but no longer does he control my will at all. I have a choice. We are free to forsake every thing that comes against us and say, I will trust God in this situation. Joy is gone because we do not fully accept Christ's full and free grace. This is good for you, even though you don't think so. Paul said, I want to get rid of this thorn in my flesh. It's buffeting me. It's knocking him around. It's causing him a lot of stress and fear. And, and he said, Lord, take it away. And God said to him, eventually he got it. My grace is sufficient. In this, you will better represent me than if I took it away. In this, you will be a, re a revelation of my grace to people and faith in me that nobody would see unless they saw it in an afflicted individual. And it was so in his life. Once we have confessed our sins to the Lord in 1 John, one nine, he is faithful and just to forgive us the sin of not trusting him and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We simply cannot grasp the truth of God unless we repent of not trusting him in the first place. And I understand that it's easy to fall into that trap. But when you know you're in that trap, Look unto Jesus and say, oh, God, I want to trust you again. I want to trust you if you never take away this situation, this problem. I want to trust you no matter what because I want to trust you, Lord, and that's it. And if you take it away, good. If you don't, I'll praise you anyways. If I die the next day, Paul said, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to honor you. If, if they throw me into the fiery furnace and it consumes me, I still not will not bow down to your God, Nebuchadnezzar. I still will remain faithful to Jesus Christ. If the lions eat me, said Daniel, I still, as they're eating me, will give you praise. I will trust you no matter what I'm going through. That's the kind of trust I'm talking about this morning. And it comes when the joy of the Lord is my strength, not the fear of situations and circumstances. Please note number 10 on the screen, if you will. Yes, there is a time 
to repent, but there's also a time to rejoice in forgiveness. So after repentance, if there's anything in your life that needs to be repented of, you go to God and you say, I'm going to rejoice like I've never rejoiced. I'm going to have a hallelujah time together with you. And I'm going to trust you though you never take it away. Listen to this from Nehemiah. Nehemiah 8, 9 to 10. The word of God said there is to be a day of joy and gladness. This day is holy unto the Lord your God. Mourn not nor weep, neither be ye sorry, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Nehemiah 8, 12 next. And the people went their way to make great mirth, happiness, because they had understood the words declared unto them, our joy is our deliverance. Our joy is our deliverance because it means I trust you, Jesus. I trust you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you that we can trust you. There's no reason we can't trust you. And the trials of life are hard sometimes. They, they create a great deal of test in our will to serve you. They make us doubt at times, and we have to bounce back by saying, Oh, Lord, I'm sorry. I want to trust you. I want to trust you. Help me to trust you. Cause me to trust you and to rejoice in every situation, even in this trial I'm going through. Help me to rejoice. In my flesh, I can't do that, but you can give me that strength. I want to be a Christian that people look at and say, how can that happen? How can they rejoice in this horrible situation I know they're going through? And if they ask us, we can say, because Jesus, I trust Jesus. I serve Jesus. And no matter what, I love him and will serve him. Lord, if there's anyone watching us by way of television or internet that has not received you as their Lord and Savior, oh God, please work on their hearts. Please work on their hearts. The best thing they could do is give their life to you, receiving you as their Savior, committing their life to you, asking forgiveness for their sins and being saved by the blood of Christ. And Lord, if there's someone out there who this message has touched deeply, I pray that you will get each one of them to ask for help and deliverance from you, not from their trial, but from that which has caused them to not trust you, not to rejoice in you. Help them, Lord God, to have the capacity to say, Jesus, you're enough, and I praise you. And I ask that in the name of Jesus, for the glory of God Almighty.